By the middle of 1966, the battalion faced an acute shortage of FTC and firing battery personnel. This was due to normal rotation of personnel and the distinct lack of school-trained replacements. The problem was solved by conducting an intensive on-the-job training program for the new personnel. In spite of supporting so many operations, the battalion was engaged in other aspects of fire support that proved of equal importance. The battalion supported special forces camps in its area. At the conjunction of the Song Bay and Song Dong Nai rivers stands the Kai Kai Special Forces Camp. Although fully operational, it is being strengthened in depth by Vietnamese civilian workers, some of whom are shown here making bricks for fortification. Located 45 kilometers northeast of Benoit, Kai Kai is the early warning outpost of a larger U.S. Special Forces Camp, Zom Kut. This plaque is being erected in honor of Zomkop's former commander. In memory of Captain Leo Michael Donker, killed in action, 3 April 1966. Kai Kai, established in February in a Viet Cong controlled area, is manned by Vietnamese personnel called strikers. They are shown here, lined up for Reveille as their company commander selects a patrol. This observation tower symbolizes Kai Kai's defenses. Living quarters adjoin the defense bunkers. Another observation tower atop a concrete emplacement is manned by a striker who keeps a watchful eye beyond the perimeter. Emplaced mortars are ready for the VC. Barbed wire lines a ditch in which Claymore mines are laid. Concertina wire adds to the perimeter defense. Drums of gasoline connected to explosive charges are designed to create a wall of fire around the camp. Kai Kai's defenses are strong and getting stronger. This proved very important for the instant available firepower made each camp much less vulnerable to frontal attack by the VC. The battalion made the cost in terms of VC casualty too high for the VC to attempt an attack. The net result was that each camp supported by the battalion remained secure throughout 1966. Fire support was extended to new camps as they were built in range of the battalion's weapons. Artillery support was extended to various popular forces outposts and hamlets in the battalion's area. On at least two occasions, its support played a large role in preventing these camps from being overrun. Defense of the Phuc Vinh base camp on occasion occupied the 6th of the 27th. Nightly harassment and interdiction fire from the battalion as well as from the 105 howitzer and 4.2 mortar units also in Phuc Vinh was an effective deterrent against a major ground attack. Because of this and because of the extensive program of patrols launched by the 1st Brigade and the various Arvin units in the area, Phuc Vinh was never hit by a large ground offensive in 1966. The battalion suffered its first casualty on July 26, 1966. First Lieutenant Thomas Eddy, Charlie Battery, aged 29 of New Brunfels, Texas, was killed in an accidental shooting by a gate guard. It was Lieutenant Eddy's practice to do a perimeter search around the base camp of Phuc Vinh when he was officer of the guard. Upon returning from his nightly perimeter patrol, he failed to acknowledge the challenge by one of the gate guard's demand to halt who goes there. Perhaps he did not hear the guard's challenge, or he just thought the guard would recognize him and allow him to pass. We will never know. When he failed to halt and give the knight's password, the guard fired three rounds from his M14 into Captain Eddie's chest. He died instantly. Walter Albright wrote on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial website. In 1967, his family and friends established the Captain Thomas E. Eddy Memorial Award in his honor, which is given each year to an outstanding Texas Lutheran College
football player, along with a nominal scholarship. The current Texas Lutheran University Media Guide for Football lists all the players honored with the award. This award has been highly regarded by the players over the past 47 years and will continue to be in the future. I was honored to receive the award in 1972. Before his parents passed several years ago, all of the players honored by the award would meet with them at an annual picnic and had a great time visiting with them and each other. Mr. and Mrs. Eddie were wonderful people and always called us their sons. I did not know Thomas, but I am sure he was much like his parents and his loss was tragic. It is said that Captain Eddie's parents wrote the soldier who fired the fatal shots to tell him that he should not feel that the incident was his fault. Captain Eddie is buried at Sam Houston National Cemetery. He was posthumously promoted to captain. June 8, 1966, the battalion's personnel section completed a permanent change of station. It moved from Tonsonut to Longvin. Here it joined nearby with the personnel sections from the other battalions in the 23rd Artillery Group. In September and October 1966, the battalion experienced a period of severe personnel turbulence when large numbers of personnel who had served with the battalion since its arrival in Vietnam had completed their tours of duty and returned to the United States. Among those who departed was the battalion commander, Colonel Robert J. McKay. He was replaced by Major Edward C. O. Connor who assumed command of the battalion on September 1, 1966. Beginning in the fall of 1966, the 6th of the 27th launched a major building program to get its men out of tents and into substantial buildings. It proved to be a prodigious undertaking spanning many months. Building materials were received through both official, primarily the 168th engineers, and unofficial channels. Troop labor was used almost exclusively in this self-help program. Direct engineer support was minor throughout. Though the labor involved was prodigious, the program was so successful that headquarters and Charlie batteries were out of tents by April 1967. The same feat was accomplished by service battery by June 1967, while Alpha Battery succeeded in housing all its men in tents with wooden frames, considerably more substantial than their predecessors by May of 1967. It should be noted that semi-permanent buildings could not be built at Quan Loi. Tent frames were the best that could be provided. Progress of the building program can be gauged by progress in headquarters battery at Phu Quyen. By October 19, 1966, the battery had built Quonset huts for the operations section, the medical section, and the orderly room, a mess hall, a small bachelor's officer's quarters, and the framework for the headquarters building completed the battery's substantial structures. All this was done by a crew of six to eight men, primarily from the wire section. Captain Charles M. Rue, the base development officer, drew the blueprints and determined the location of buildings. The plans were in accordance with directives from USRV. Laying the pads was greatly facilitated by the use of a cement mixer procured by the service battery commander. Originally, the building crew comprised of men from all batteries. After these personnel rotated home, HQ battery provided all of its labor. The Charlie Battery Building Program was equally comprehensive. Beginning in late November 1966, the battery built steadily until April when they began to experience a shortage of materials. Eight troop billets, a supply quonset, a mess hall, a shower latrine complex, and an NCO club and an EM club, an executive post and an FDC were all built by troop labor with engineer assistance. In addition, wooden gun pads were constructed. These kept the guns clean, improved maintenance by keeping mud from the working parts of the gun, and provided a level firing program.
Alpha Battery's building program was plagued by its many moves. While at Bearcat, the battery had constructed a mess hall, an orderly room, NCO club, an EM club, an XO post, FDC, a BOQ, and 10 wooden tent frames. All this was left at Bearcat when the battery moved to Lai K in December 1966. Building was not renewed until after the battery became settled at Quan Loi on February 4, 1967. There they built 20 tent frame billet, a communications center, an XO post, an underground cement structure FDC, a mess hall, an officer's NCO club, and an EM club. Here too, labor was used exclusively. Materials were brought from service battery by plane or convoy or purchased on the local economy through the club funds. Service Battery's building program was in two distinct stages. The battery built a large building to house the 23rd Artillery Group personnel section, another to house the Battalion S-4, a mess hall, a BOQ, an orderly room supply room, a building for battery maintenance, and an NCO club and an EM club. These projects were begun immediately after the battery arrived in Longbin and were completed by September 1, 1966. Further building was hampered, however, by the fact that the permanent location of the battery had not yet been firmly decided. A permanent home for the battery was established in February 1967 through a series of conferences between the battalion commander, 23rd Artillery Group commander, and the Longbin Post Commander. The new area was immediately adjacent to the old area and was part of Long Bend Post, a huge complex which was slated to become the headquarters of the U.S. Army in Vietnam. From that date on, service battery began erection of Adams huts. These were personnel billets made of a lightweight, highly reflective aluminum. These billets were designed especially for use in Vietnam and boasted extraordinary coolness on the inside. By June 1967, eight Adams huts had been built. In addition, the EM and NCO clubs were remodeled. The building crew received engineer assistance only on the first hut. Three men on HQ battery were sent to service battery to augment the building crew. As you probably have figured out by now, when the battalion arrived in Vietnam, they did not move into existing buildings. All they brought with them were various tents. It was only through hard work and ingenuity that they were able to construct buildings needed to live and work in Vietnam. Most of the buildings were not pretty to look at, but they satisfied the purpose of their construction. On September 19, 1966, the battalion was alerted by higher headquarters to prepare a heavy artillery battery for movement to Quang Tri Province near the DMZ. It had been decided that the Marine element operating in the area desperately needed heavy artillery support, as the Marines did not have a weapon as large and as powerful as the 175mm gun in their arsenal. It was up to the Army to provide this weapon. In order to send the best possible unit to the DMZ, Major O'Connor created an amalgamated battery at Phuc Binh, mating the best portions of Bravo Battery and Charlie Batteries. The result was called Task Force 6 to the 27th, or B Battery, from whence the major portion of its men and equipment came. The task force left Phuc Vinh on September 23, 1966, and went to a position just south of the Song Bay Bridge, where it remained for two days. It then moved to the service battery location at Long Bend, where it was completely resupplied and the vehicles rechecked. Two 8-inch howitzers were converted to 175mm guns during this period.
On September 29th, the battery's equipment was driven to Saigon and loaded onto an LST, a loading ship transport. Altogether, 26 vehicles were loaded onto this boat, marking the first time a 175mm gun was transported anywhere by LST. The LST sailed to Da Nang, taking four days to do so. At Da Nang, the equipment was transferred from the LST to six LCUs, landing craft utility, for further shipment to Dong Ha. This was necessary as the last LST was too large to sail up the Kam Lo River to Dong Ha, whereas the smaller LCUs could. The major portion of the battery's personnel was flown to Dong Ha and met the equipment ships there. Following unloading, the battery moved overland to their new home at Camp J.J. Carroll on the artillery plateau near Cam Lo. Approximately two and a half hours later, the battery fired the first heavy artillery round in support of Marines in the I-Corps tactical unit by an army unit into North Vietnam. On October 19, 1966, the 2nd Battalion, 94th Artillery, arrived on the artillery plateau. B Battery was attached to this organization shortly thereafter, eventually becoming known as Delta Battery, 2nd Battalion, 94th Artillery. An unfortunate side effect of this was the loss of the battery's former 6th of the 27th call sign, Red Leg. Interestingly, the 6th of the 27th taught the 2nd of the 94th a great deal about combat operations in Vietnam. The latter unit was newly arrived in Vietnam from Fort Sill and knew little about 6400 mil operation. They eventually adopted almost all of the standard operating procedures used by the B Battery Commander, Captain Gary E. Vanderslice. Battery received little control from the 2nd of the 94th on fire mission. The battalion usually supplied only the coordinates of the targets to be shot. All computing and checking of the fire data was done entirely within the battery's own fire detection center. Some missions came directly from the marine elements. In October and November 1966, Bravo Battery's operations became somewhat hampered by the onset of the monsoon season. Torrential rains created great discomfort and prodigious amounts of mud. The men were not equipped with adequate wet weather apparel, compounding problem. Further discomfort was caused by the plummeting temperatures. Readings in the 30 to 40 degree range were recorded. The battery could do little building because of the constant rain. Eventually, the 2nd of the 94th applied hardbacks, wooden tent frames and floors, which got the men out of the mud at least. Bravo Battery experienced a number of other minor problems during its first few months at Camp Carroll. Ordnance support was negligible, even though a team from the 185th Maintenance Battalion accompanied the battery on its trip to the I Corps area. Supplies were hard to come by. Bravo Battery received its supplies through marine channels at first. In spite of this, an adequate supply system was not placed in operation for the battery until other army units arrived in the area. Bravo Battery, 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery, attached as Delta Battery to the 2nd and the 94th, rotated on 24 March 1967 to Geo Lin, which continued to come under enemy rocket, mortar, and artillery attacks. Delta Battery underwent the heaviest single attack at Geo Lin, withstanding over 1,000 rounds of incoming. During the attacks, the gun section returned the fire and destroyed two enemy artillery pieces and caused numerous secondary explosions. The attacks continued nightly and on 
30 April 1967, PFC Leonard Martin was killed in action while manning his gun. It's been reported that Martin told family and friends that he did not particularly want to be in Vietnam, but had a job to do and would rather be fighting in the war than carrying protest signs at home. The camp at Geolin became a nightly target for mortar attack. One night over 600 rounds fell onto the camp. Charlie Battery, 2nd in the 94th, replaced Delta Battery, B Battery, 6th of the 27th, at Geolin on 28 May 1967. During the 16 days they occupied the position, they received 38 attacks. For its distinguished service in I Corps, during the period October 2, 1966 to September 10, 1967, in support of the 3rd Marine Amphibious Force at the Demilitarized Zone, Battery B, 6th Battalion, 27th Artillery, was awarded the Meritorious Unit Commendation. The commendation reads in part, during the nine-month period from October 1966 to June 1967, Battery B fired 30,000 rounds in the I Corps Tactical Zone inflicting heavy casualties upon the hostile elements, through their exemplary courage, esprit de corps, and total dedication to mission accomplishment, the battery's personnel contributed immeasurably to the United States military effort in the Republic of Vietnam. Charlie Battery added a new term to artillerymen's vocabulary, beginning in November 1966 when it engaged in a number of turkey shoots. These were a series of moves by the battery to positions outside the base camp made to bring new targets into range that would otherwise have been out of reach. An average gain of 5,000 meters was gained on each turkey shoot. A total of five shoots were conducted by Charlie Battery during December of 1966 and January of 67. MedCat Medical Civic Action Programs were held in conjunction with three of these firings. On one occasion, a direct fire exercise was held. Both the 8-inch platoon and the 175 platoon participated. Four VC base camps were destroyed by these exercises. The net results were increased proficiency of units, an increase in morale by allowing the cannoneers to move out of a static firing position, and destruction of the enemy's belief that he could operate with immunity outside the range of the big guns. Alpha Battery also engaged in a series of moves. The first occurred on December 27, 1966, when they moved from Bearcat to Lie Cave. No incidents occurred during this move. The second permanent change of station occurred on February 3rd, 1967, when the battery moved to Quan Loy. Again, no incidents occurred. We'll talk about this move in a coming part three. During November and December 1966, the battalion conducted tests with the 175mm gun to determine the effectiveness of the various types of fuses, quick and delay, in the jungle. Rounds were fired into single canopy jungle, double canopy jungle, and triple canopy jungle, and into open areas. It was found that quick fuse was better than fuse delay in single canopy jungle. It avoided the deep burrowing action prevalent with the latter. Fuse delay was better in double and triple canopy jungle as it penetrated the primary growth. The effect of fire was not absorbed by the foliage. Fuse quick yielded tree bursts. The 6th of the 27th continued its civic action program throughout the last quarter of 1966. The medical section conducted seven MedCap operations during that period, examining a total of 309 Vietnamese patients. Of these, more than 40 were reported to be seriously ill. This program received increased value with the arrival of a replacement surgeon. A Thanksgiving dinner was served to 50 children of the Phuc Vinh School. A Christmas party was held for the 320 children from the same school. The children were given refreshments and a gift. A prime booster of morale for the battalion was the r, r Rest and Recreation Program. Through this program, each soldier was given the opportunity to visit for five to seven day period one of several far eastern cities. Later, Hawaii was added to the list with transportation provided free by the government. 
In order to determine the program was being adequately utilized, the battalion conducted a survey. It was found in this comparative study that during the period June 1966 to January 1967, only 172 of 331 R&R quotas were used. This low percentage of use, 51%, demonstrated that an increase in r, &R quotas would not necessarily cause an increase in the financial capacity and desire of individuals for recreation. And I might add, it's possible that a lot of GIs just wanted to save their money. In spite of the fact that the battalion was in a combat zone, considerable emphasis was placed on individual and unit training. Beginning in December 1966, gunner's tests and maintenance exams were administered bi-monthly to the gun sections. And so as 1966 came to a close, we found the batteries in various locations. Service battery was at Longbin, Alpha was at Lai K. Headquarters and Charlie batteries were at Phuc Vinh, while Bravo was at Camp J.J. Carroll, just south of the DMZ. It had been a year of relocation, building, and fire missions.